During inhalation, air moves from the larynx into the trachea, or windpipe. The trachea is about 12 centimeters long. That's about 5 inches. It's about 2.5 centimeters in diameter, which is about 1 inch. It's located anterior to the esophagus, so the esophagus would be situated behind it and extends all the way to about the fifth thoracic vertebra, or T5. At this position, T5, is where it divides into the right and left primary bronchus. At this division, there's a region known as the carina. This is where we have a lot of sensory receptors that, when irritated, will cause you to cough. But notice that the right primary bronchus is located here. The left primary bronchus is located here. The left primary bronchus is a little bit longer in that it has to travel around the heart, which would be found here in the mediastinum. The right primary bronchus is a little bit wider and more vertical than the left primary bronchus. So that left primary bronchus is longer, lo it angles a little more horizontally around that heart to get to the left lung. So for that reason, aspiration, which is inhalation of a foreign object, whether it's liquid or an, an actual uh, solid object, it has a higher chance of being lodged into the right primary bronchus as opposed to the left due to its more vertical and wider structure. So air goes from the trachea to the right or left primary or main bronchi. Each of those are going to then divide into secondary or lobar bronchi. Lobar is in reference to a lobe. So notice on this drawing, you can see the difference in the right and the left lung. The right lung has three lobes, therefore it has three lobar or secondary bronchi. The left lung has two lobes, so it has two lobar bronchi. Those bronchi are then going to divide into what's known as segmental bronchi. We can take each lobe and divide it further into segments. And each segment has its own segmental or tertiary bronchus. Then those segmental bronchi branch into many bronchioles. And those bronchioles keep branching and branching. And then eventually they lead to what's known as the terminal bronchioles. Terminal bronchioles are, are the bronchi that are still part of the conduction zone. Therefore, we cannot do any gas exchange through any of these structures. But air from the terminal bronchioles then goes to a respiratory bronchial. And we're going to see why a respiratory bronchial allows gas exchange. It's because they actually have little out pouches um, of alveoli. A couple other things to note. Cartilage can be found in the primary or main, secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi. But when you get down to these smaller airways, the bronchioles, the cartilage kind of disappears. And that's so you can dilate and constrict these smaller airways. So there's a lot of air regulation done at the bronchioles because we can dilate them, make them larger, or constrict them and make them smaller. So there's a lot of smooth muscle regulation of the size of the bronchioles. Whereas these larger airways tend to have more cartilage to keep them open, keep prevent them from collapsing, but they can't dilate and constrict as well because of that cartilage. You'll also notice that there's a notch in the left lung. This notch is or the heart um, to be positioned. So that left lung is actually a bit smaller in volume because of this cardiac notch. 
And then we see the diaphragm, which we'll be talking much more about, primary respiratory muscle that we have, which it will flatten when you inhale, it'll go down when you inhale, and then go back up when you exhale. Other differences we see in the, in the right and left lung include the lobes, again. Uh, the right lung has three lobes, the left lung has two. The fissures are these deep slits that divide the lung up into the lobes. So you'll notice these are actual lateral views of the two lungs. And you can see that there's two fissures that divide the left lung, or right lung, I'm sorry, into three lobes. Whereas the left lung has one fissure, an oblique fissure on an angle, which separates the two lobes of the left lung. Total capacity. The right lung has a higher capacity than the left lung. That's because there's no cardiac notch in the left lung, or in the right lung, I'm sorry, geez. The height varies. Even though these pictures don't quite show it, the, the right lung is actually shorter than the left lung. That's because there's a large liver located here. That liver kind of pushes up on that right lung during development and may, forces the right lung to be a little bit shorter, yet it still has a, a greater capacity than the left lung because of that cardiac notch. So there are some differences between right and left lung. This is a medial view of each lung, and this just adds this structure to our understanding of a lung known as the hilum or root. This is what the, how you can get in or out of a lung, basically. All right, so you're going to have blood vessels in the hilum, either the pulmonary blood vessels, the, the, the pulmonary arteries, or the pulmonary veins. Um, you got to have blood going in and out. There's going to be the airways shown here, entering or exiting the lungs. There's also going to be lymph because you have to drain these lungs of, of excess interstitial fluid. So you would see some lymphatics coming out of the lungs here at the hilum as well. So just another view. Notice the top of the lungs is known as the apex. The bottom of the lungs is known as the base. You can note the fissures again and the, the lobes. As we get deeper and deeper down the respiratory tract, we get to what's known as a lobule of a lung. That's basically a small little microscopic lobe. So notice this arrow is saying we're looking at something right in here. You can't see with the naked eye. So it's more of a microscopic drawing of what's known as a, a lobule. On this drawing, we begin here at a terminal bronchial, so that's what this represents. Notice that there's some smooth muscle. Uh, this is smooth muscle that can regulate that diameter of that terminal bronchial. If we followed that terminal bronchial, we would end up at a respiratory bronchial. Notice there's little outpouches, little alveoli at the respiratory bronchioles. That's why the respiratory bronchioles are the beginning of the respiratory zone because you can do gas exchange at respiratory bronchioles. Then we would go to alveolar ducts that supply air to what's known as an alveolar sac, which is many alveoli that share that duct. So all these little <laughs> grape-like structures are the alveoli. That's the end of the respiratory tract. Those alveoli are covered with pulmonary capillaries. Notice this alveolar sac shows all these pulmonary capillaries coating the alveoli to provide a nice large surface area for gas exchange. How do we get the blood there? Notice the pulmonary arteriole is going to be delivering the blood down to the pulmonary capillaries. Pulmonary capillaries are going to be picking up the oxygen, and then the blood leaves those pulmonary capillaries and pulmonary venules, and those venules are eventually going to become veins, which bring the blood back 
to the heart. So you have to know airflow down to an alveolus. How does air get there? Blood flow, we need to revisit our pulmonary circulation, pulmonary arteries, pulmonary capillaries, pulmonary veins. You'll also notice that there's lymphatics in your lungs. These green vessels are all the lymphatic vessels that are draining that excess interstitial fluid that could develop in the lungs, known as pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema can be a very problematic uh, condition in that it makes gas exchange much more difficult. You'll also find on this drawing some elasticity. Lungs have a lot of elastic connective tissue that allows them to stretch out during inhalation and recoil in during exhalation. There are some trends to consider. As you get further down the respiratory tract, the epithelial tissue is going to change. And there's a lot of different changes. I'm just going to highlight a couple uh, of the types of epithelial tissue. Now remember, this is lining the inside of the respiratory tract. The upper respiratory tract is a little thicker. Uh, it's got more cilia, so there's a lot of cilia in the upper respiratory tract, uh, as well as the trachea has a lot of cilia. Uh, the trachea is known to have ciliated, pseudostratified epithelial tissue. kind of looks like there's many layers of cells, but it's really a single layer of cells. By the time you get down to the alveoli, these alveoli down here are made of a simple squamous epithelial tissue. And that's going to allow a very efficient gas exchange through that alveolar wall. Cartilage kind of goes away. A lot of hyaline cartilage in upper airways. By the time you get to the bronchioles, cartilage has pretty much gone away. Notice here we're at a terminal bronchial, no cartilage. There's no cartilage on any of these airways here at this terminal end. But what's more important at this terminal end is smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is very important along the bronchioles. It regulates that lumen diameter. We call that bronchodilation and bronchoconstriction. We bronchodilate to get more air down to the alveoli. We bronchoconstrict when we don't need as much air in the alveoli. So these are just three things to think about as far as what, what are some of the general changes that occur as we progress down the respiratory tract. This is our last uh, kind of anatomical look at the respiratory tract. This is the very, very terminal end, very microscopic in that we're actually looking at cell, at the cell level. This is a single alveolus, so air is going to be entering in here and we're doing the gas exchange between the alveolus and this blood in the pulmonary capillaries. Notice that there's a number of pulmonary capillaries drawn surrounding this single alveolus. So what should we look at in this drawing? Well, we have the alveolus, the air sac, and it's made of a simple squamous epithelium, and those cells are called type 1 alveolar cells. So type 1 alveolar cells form the alveolus. We also have what's called type 2 alveolar cells, or septal cells, shown right here. Those guys produce a material known as surfactants. Surfactants reduce the surface tension within an alveolus. Surface tension is due to water, and it's the stickiness of moist surfaces. So this inside surface of the alveolus is going to be moist. It's going to be wet. And if the surface made contact with one another, this alveolus would collapse. It would stick inside. Surfactants disrupt that surface tension. So it allows the, this alveolus to stay open and not collapse. And we'll talk more about that as we progress through the physiology, but you need these alveoli 
to have very little surface tension on the inside to prevent collapse. So that guy produces surfactants. Surfactants are not produced until the end of fetal development. So babies that are born prematurely don't have the surfactants in their lungs. And those little, tiny little bit lungs would collapse inward and stick in, these alveoli would stick. So one treatment that has to be done uh, with premature babies is to give them synthetic surfactants into their lungs. Another type of cell are macrophages. They're alveolar macrophages known as dust cells. They're sitting inside the alveolus, and we already know what macrophages are for. They're there to capture any microbes that might have made it their way all the way to the alveolus. So you've got a few different cell types. You have the pulmonary capillary, and very important, the interface between the alveolus and the blood in the capillary. That interface is known as the respiratory membrane. The respiratory membrane is what oxygen and CO2 have to pass through during pulmonary respiration. That membrane needs to be very, very thin. That membrane is made up of four things. The capillary endothelium, which would be, in essence, this cell that forms that endothelium. It's a simple squamous. There's a basement membrane of it. Then there's a basement membrane of the alveolus. And then there's the type 1 alveolar cell. So if you think of oxygen, so we're expanding on this one, I guess. So let's look at, the, here's the respiratory membrane. We want oxygen from in here to get into the blood. We want carbon dioxide from the blood to get into the alveolus. So if we look at that membrane, it has the endothelium, a couple basement membranes, one of the capillary, one of the alveolus, and then the type 1 alveolar cell. And that's how oxygen has to, that's what oxygen has to get through to get into this red blood cell. That's what carbon dioxide has to get through to get into the alveolus. It's known as the respiratory membrane. One problem with pulmonary edema is fluid accumulating in that membrane. And when fluid accumulates in that membrane, that membrane gets wider. And it's harder for oxygen and CO2 to diffuse. So that's kind of what I would consider the end of the anatomy portion of the respiratory system. Continuing on with the next video, we're going to begin looking at function of the respiratory system. And we're going to start with ventilation, which how do we inhale, how do we exhale. And that involves muscles, skeletal muscles, collectively known as your respiratory muscles.